Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. This is another Q&A video. And this question comes from uh, an extended conversation, but it's, uh, I'm going to, rather than rehash it all, uh, I'm going to synthesize the question into one thing. And the question is, what is your attitude towards sin? Before I answer this question, uh, I am prepared that uh, I will probably be criticized by two groups of people. One group will accuse me of giving people a license to sin. And then another group of people will accuse me of being a legalist. So I expect to get <laughs> criticism on both sides. But this is uh, my attitude towards sin, and it's based upon what the scriptures say. First of all, the penalty of sin is paid in full by Jesus, our Savior God. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, which was death, so that we can have life everlasting. However, the law of reaping and sowing, or cause and effect, will still apply itself to our decisions and actions. Bad actions yield bad consequences. Not only the consequences during our lifetime, but when we leave this world and, and go to meet Jesus at the Bema Seat of Christ, the Judgment Seat of Christ, we must also face Jesus and get judged for our ministries to determine what is wood hand stubble and what is precious gems. We will then be uh, awarded our rewards for our ministries, for our lives, uh, and how we conducted ourselves, what we did in the name of Jesus, after we got saved. And then the final point I want to make is that even though our sins are paid for by Jesus' death on the cross, sin remains a serious issue today for all of us. Now, let's look at some scriptures. In 1 John 2.2, 2, it says, uh, He, meaning Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, propitiation is a, a big word, but it just simply means that Jesus' death on the cross was satisfactory. It it served as a sufficient payment for all of our sins. Uh, his death on the cross atoned for our sins. And it says not for our, ours only, meaning all of us who believe in Jesus for eternal life, but even for the sins of the whole world. Uh, and if we look at John one twenty nine, John the Baptist pointing to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he just didn't die and pay for the sins of a select few. He suffered and died and paid for the sins of everyone who's ever lived. So regarding salvation and eternal life, sin is not the issue today because the sin issue was already resolved when Jesus paid for our sins. The issue today for salvation and eternal life is receiving eternal life from Jesus as a free gift by putting our faith in him, putting our complete confidence in Jesus as our Savior. So today the issue for salvation is not sin. The issue is faith in Jesus or no faith in Jesus. Now, uh, all that's really required for us to receive this gift of eternal life is to believe. And if we look at Acts chapter 16, 
It says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, you notice that they were not given a, a list of things to do. They, only one thing was stated. And I think that the Apostle Paul uh, believed that water baptism and repenting of sins and changing your life and on and on and on, if he thought all those things were required for salvation, he would have included them in his answer. But when he was asked, what must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means depend on Jesus for salvation and he'll give it to you. And this is clarified further in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now let's go to verse 10, which is often neglected and forgotten. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So to me, these three verses put uh, sin and salvation and faith all in the proper perspective. Uh, it says, for by grace you have been saved. In other words, because God has been gracious to us, we, we have been saved. In other words, when you put your faith in Jesus, it's done. We've been saved through our faith. When we put our faith or our confidence in Jesus as our Savior, it's settled. And it goes on to say, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This salvation is a gift. And it also says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see clearly that eternal life, salvation, is a gift, and a gift is free. So it has nothing to do with what we do. It has to do with God being gracious, loving us so much, he wants us to have eternal life, and he gives it to us on one condition. We put our faith in the Savior. We we put our complete confidence in Jesus to save us, and then we receive this salvation as a gift. And it says it's not of, our, not of works either. It's not based upon us getting water baptized, doing an altar call, um, um, turning over a new leaf in our life, becoming a religious person, repenting of our sins. No, it's not based on any of our own personal efforts. It's, otherwise, it says we could boast we could boast to God and say, look, I deserve eternal life. I deserve to be in heaven because of what I did. No, no one has the right to do that because Jesus gets all the credit, all the glory, because based upon what he did for us. And now in verse 10, the verse that so many people want to ignore. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, God wants us to have eternal life because he loves us, but there's more to it than that. He has a plan for our lives, and the plan is for us to do good works. And it says, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. Now, earlier, I said the Apostle Paul was asked, what must I do to be saved? And he said, what you must do is simply believe on Jesus. And here it tells us what we should do. We should walk in our good works. We should want to do good works. So I have a video titled The Difference Between Must and Should, and that's exactly what it is. There's one thing we must do to be saved, to get eternal life. One thing, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we get eternal life. But there's other things that we should do, and we should want to do good works. We should want to uh, have a ministry and start serving Jesus, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. 
and serve. Jesus said, if you want to be great, become the servant of all. So now let's look at 2 Timothy 1.9. He says, who has saved us, referring to Jesus, Jesus has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done. He didn't save us because of anything we've done. But because of his own purpose and grace. So, he's called us to a holy life. We're saved not because of anything we did, not because of our own personal merit, but he has also called us to a holy life. And in Romans 12, too, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here we're being exhorted by the Apostle Paul to don't conform to the world, don't become part of the world, and, and uh, don't make this world your love. We're in the world, but we don't want to be of the world. We don't want to be like all of the lost people in the world that are having idols, uh, money, careers, a fame, all these things that people are idolizing and worshiping. No, we live in the world, but we're not supposed to be conformed to this world. But we're supposed to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us and is going to transform us so that we will want to live a holy life and do that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. If we look at Ephesians chapter 4, it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, with all malice. So here we're being exhorted again and told uh, these are things that we should not do. Be bitter, angry, evil speaking. Uh, rather, instead, we should follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. If you put your faith in Jesus as your Savior, Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to live inside you, and you're a child of God, and the Holy Spirit is going to be prompting you, trying to guide you through life so that you do the right things, not do the wrong things, so you'll think the right things, don't think the wrong things. The Holy Spirit wants to transform you. And if you're wise, you listen to the Spirit, and you follow the promptings of the Spirit, but it says here, don't grieve it. If you resist the Holy Spirit by wanting to do your own thing, instead of doing what the Spirit is directing you to do, you are grieving the Spirit of God. Now, what about judging other people? Uh, I'm going to read now the favorite verse of everyone in the world who is lost. This Verse has been quoted to me by the lost people more than any other. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that ye be judged, not judged. Judge not that ye be not judged. So the lost people, they don't want anyone judging them, their lives. They don't want anybody to say that there is um, uh, actual morality. They, they want everything to be gray instead of black and white. But the Bible is written in black and white and red. The blood of Jesus and the red letter words of Jesus. And uh, there, uh, there is no gray. So uh, there is such a thing as right and wrong. And moral re relativity is a lie from the devil. And this verse is saying, Judge not that ye be not judged. So... Is Jesus telling us not to judge in this verse and in this section? Well, let's read on. For with what judgment ye judge, 
ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that in the, is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is thy, in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So if we really look at this honestly in context, uh, this section is not as much about judging as it is about hypocrisy. He says, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So here we're being told, yes, you can judge as long as you first are sure that you're not doing the same thing. Don't go telling people to, to stop lying if you've continued to be a liar, don't stop and telling people to uh, commit sexual sins when you have your own secret, secret sexual sins. So this is a section denouncing the hypocrites. And uh, we're not expected to not judge. We are expected to judge. And the Bible clearly says there is such a thing as sin. And there is a clear difference between right and wrong, and we should be able to judge what is right and what is wrong. The Bible clearly states many things that are forbidden, and many things that we're instructed to do which are good. Now, let's look at this verse. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So here, we're instructed to judge. That's right. You should be judgmental. We need to judge, but we must judge righteous judgment. We judge based upon what the scriptures say. The scriptures say, thou shalt not kill. I can clearly make a judgment say that if you're killing, that's wrong. Killing is wrong. I, I can clearly say the Bible says, don't lie. And if you're lying, I can judge that that is wrong. There is such a thing as right and wrong. So, we should judge. Matter of fact, someone once said, the only thing we do more than breathing every day is judging. We're making judgments every day. And someone once said to me at my home Bible study, a young man, and he was trying to present an argument for moral relativity. And I asked him, I said, well, you say there's no such thing as right or wrong. What if we take everyone you love and then capture them, tie them up, torture them, and kill them, and then send all the body parts to you? Is that right or wrong? You see, when it's personalized, all, then we can see clearly there is such a thing as wrong. Uh, so, yes, we need to judge, but we need to judge based upon what the Scripture says. I'm not going to judge a person. I'm just going to judge what the Scripture says. I'm going to say, the Scriptures say, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's clear. The Scriptures condemn committing adultery. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If any of you has a dispute with another... Do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? 
The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, there's a list. There's other lists in the Bible, too. The list could really be expanded more and more. There are so many things that are sins. Uh, some people want to water down the concept of sin and act like they they are no longer sinning and they don't sin. One person uh, said to me that they hadn't sinned in 40 years. But they're not being honest about what sin is. Uh, Paul complained. He says, I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. That's a sin of omission. Let's say there's the Spirit of God is prompting you to do something good for someone, and you push it aside and don't do it. That's a sin of omission. Most people think all sins are only sins of commission. Paul says, I know what I'm not supposed to do, and then I go ahead and do it. So sometimes we commit a sin by committing an act. Sometimes we commit a sin by omitting to do or neglecting to do what the Spirit is prompting us to do. And then sometimes it's not an act at all. It's just a thought. Jesus said uh, that people commit adultery in their hearts and their minds. They commit murder in their hearts and their minds. So if you're going to be honest, we're all sinning all the time. Every person sins constantly if you want to be honest about it. Now, let's, some people, take this attitude. Paul says, quote, you say, I have the right to do anything. You say, but Paul says, not everything is beneficial. They say, I have the right to do anything. But Paul says, but I will not be mastered by anything. So, yes, once you put your faith in Jesus, as it says here, all these people, the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, everyone else, the drunkards, their sins were paid for. When they put, they put their faith in Jesus Christ and they are saved. They have eternal life. But some people, will come around and say, well, I have the right to do anything. I can do anything I want now. But Paul says, well, go ahead. But you're going to find out that it's not beneficial for you. Now, in Matthew, it also says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So we're told that we really have to take sin seriously, not only in our own lives, but among the brethren. 
We cannot just ignore sins and, and wink at each other. We have to, you know, the saying goes, uh, call a spade a spade and, and not, not act like, uh, either we, we're not aware of it or it's, it's okay or, uh, don't worry about it. Go do whatever you like. You have a, uh, some people say you have a license to sin. Well, Jesus paid for our sins, but we must take sin seriously and not simply laugh about it. So let me recap the main points here. What is your attitude towards sin? Well, the penalty of sin is paid in full by Jesus. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, death, so that we can have life everlasting. However, the law of reaping and sowing, or cause and effect, will still apply itself to our decisions and actions. Bad actions yield bad consequences. If you want to cheat on your spouse, you have an affair, you, the consequences will be divorce, broken families, sexually transmitted diseases. There's consequences for sins. It's reaping and sowing. And then the beam of seed of Christ. Every Christian is expected to have a ministry. Once we become a child of God, we're supposed to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, and we're supposed to serve God and serve our fellow man. And we're going to be judged upon how well we do that. After we die and we meet Jesus, he's going to determine all the things that were valuable in his eyes to, that we had done. And those things that he values, he's going to give us treasures, rewards in heaven. And those things that he did not place any value upon, it's wood, hay, and stubble, and it's just burned up in a fire, and it's worthless. So you will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ if you do not take seriously your responsibility to, to after you're saved, to live a life for God and for our fellow man. And then we need to not laugh about sin. We need to recognize that sin still remains to be a serious issue. Not to get saved, not to remain saved, not to prove we're saved, but because God desires that we do it. And it's the healthy thing to do, and it's the right thing to do to please God, and it's a bad example to the world when we don't take sin seriously. And we have a responsibility to judge other, other believers' sins. And just point out, the scripture says this. Is that what you're doing? Okay. This is longer than I like to make a video, but uh, I believe this is an important and neglected subject. Uh, I look forward to all your comments and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.